Hi, this is Raj Mehta, and this is going to be a brief video introduction to acute kidney injury in the hospital setting. Acute kidney injury refers to a group of heterogeneous disorders that are characterized by sudden impairment in renal function. Acute kidney injury is also known as acute renal failure, but the term acute kidney injury has more commonly now come to replace it, both because the term kidney is more easily identifiable for lay people than renal, which is more of a medical term, and also reflect the fact that kidney injuries are a group of disorders and that they don't always have failure of renal function. For many of them, uh, you can just have some levels of impairment, and that's why the term acute kidney injury is preferable to acute renal failure, but they are used interchangeably. The objective criteria for uh, diagnosing acute kidney injury is either an increase in creatinine or a decrease in urine volume. The increase in creatinine can be an increase of 50% above your baseline or an increase in absolute values of 0.3 uh, for a person with a presumed normal renal function. Decrease in urine volume uh, is most easily defined as having uh, less than or equal to 0.5 milliliters per kilogram in weight of urine output for a period of greater than or equal to six hours. Once you have diagnosed acute kidney injury, there's also another way uh, to label them and or break them up, and that is non-oliguric, oliguric, and aneuric. And these are just defined as taking a value of 400 milliliters a day. And if you have more than that, you would have non-oliguric renal failure or non-oliguric kidney injury, I should say. If you have less than 400 milliliters of urine produced a day, that would be defined as oliguric acute kidney injury, and of course if you have less than 100 milliliters a day, if you're not producing any urine at all, that would be aneuric acute kidney injury. And this can sometimes help not just distinguish the severity of your kidney injury, because if you're aneuric, your patient's probably much worse than someone who's just non-oliguric, but it can also help you in your differential of what type of disorder may be causing your acute kidney injury. Once you have determined that your patient is an acute kidney injury. The next important step is to determine what type of kidney injury or renal failure, I'm going to put acute kidney injury, that your patient has. And the three basic categories are pre-renal, intrinsic, and post-renal. And you can usually distinguish between the three of them um, by both physical exam findings and by history. And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more in a detail, but it's important to keep in mind that whenever you think acute kidney injury, your very first step should be writing down, is it pre-renal, post-renal, and intrinsic? And if you're ever documenting it, make sure you always document what type of what type of kidney injury you think is going on and why you think it may not be alternative. If you think it's pre-renal, right, I don't think it's post-renal or obstructive because the patient has good urine output, which would obviously be uh, uh, against that diagnosis and etc. To go through them briefly, pre-renal, also known as pre-renal azotemia, is usually caused by uh, decreased perfusion of the kidneys. The kidneys can take up 10 to 20 percent of all cardiac output, so if you have decrease in effective arterial uh, volume or uh, perfusion, you can really decrease the volume of blood getting to the kidneys and therefore decrease your uh, urine output and uh, cause acute kidney injury. And common conditions like hypotension, let's say from dehydration or from bleeding can cause it, a decreased cardiac output can cause it, uh, and etc. And usually most of this is very easily treated by IV fluids and so forth. The next one is intrinsic. Intrinsic is uh, really within the kidney itself, there's some level of injury, and it's usually you can break it up into three places. It's either the glomeruli are injured, it's the tissue itself which is injured, or the tubules. So those are the main three areas. And then uh, if you diagnose this, then you can say, oh, I think it's acute tubular necrosis, ATN, which would be an intrinsic cause, or acute interstitial nephritis, AIN, or acute glomerular nephritis, and you can diagnose that and treat those appropriately. And then finally, the last cause is post-renal. This is obstruction. If someone has a renal stone in the ureter obstructing it, or if a gentleman has an enlarged prostate, or etc., anything that obstructs outflow of uh, urine can cause uh, post-renal uh, acute kidney injury.
Whenever uh, you're validating a patient for acute kidney injury, there are certain risk factors you should be aware of that increase the odds that people might have it. One is if they have some underlying chronic kidney disease, these patients are going to be much more susceptible to developing acute kidney injury. And also you want to be cautious of patients with heart failure or liver cirrhosis, uh, as these patients can also develop acute kidney injury, and it can be very challenging or difficult to, to manage it. So if you have a otherwise healthy patient, you can just go up and work up their kidney injury, but if they have chronic kidney disease, heart failure, or liver cirrhosis, just be a little bit more cautious uh, in evaluating that person. Now, an acute kidney injury uh, is one of those disorders where more than just your history and physical exam, which are relevant, having the appropriate lab test to really evaluate your renal function is critical to helping you distinguish what type of renal injury uh, is going on and how you need to treat it. And it's not just lab tests, but uh, data in general which you need to look at. The first thing we need to be aware of is, is our patient on any medications that could affect the renal function? Are they on diuretics? Have they had a recent contrast exposure, etc.? cetera? Um, because this can really help determine uh, if, if your renal failure maybe is from dehydration because they've been on too many diuretics, or if that may be impairing your ability to know if it's uh, something else is going on. It's good to know your patient's prior creatinines. Always try and get a baseline level. A lot of patients will have some underlying CKD, and it's good to know where your baseline is if you're going to be evaluating that patient to see how much worse they've gotten. Also be aware that creatinine is a function of muscle mass, so a lot of times elderly people will have a lot lower creatinine than some of your younger patients, and it's helpful sometimes to look at the GFR if you're unsure if your creatinine is accurate. Make sure you have good vitals and orthostatics. If your patient's very tachycardic or they have orthostatic uh, hypotension, maybe that patient's really dehydrated and that can give you a diagnosis of pre-renal azotemia. Don't just check your BMP, also check your MAG and your FOS. A lot of patients, when they have elevated creatinines, it's difficult to know, is this CKD or is this acute kidney injury? Is there some underlying chronic disease? especially if you have a patient you've never seen before. And having things like very high phosphate and low calcium can help clue you in that maybe this is more of a chronic condition. Also, if you have any signs of a metabolic acidosis, that can, again, be consistent with more chronic disease than just acute kidney injury. Make sure you have strict I's and O's. Too many times we forget that acute kidney injury can be diagnosed by decreased urine output and monitored. Uh, and not just based on your creatinine. And this is very important to know because even when you're treating the patient, you want to be following what their urine output is and making sure you're matching it. And don't be afraid to put a foley in a patient. If your patient is difficult to comply with or can't really keep the urine outputs, a foley will give you a great way to evaluate even hour by hour how that person is doing. And for the short term, if you want to do this for 24, 48 hours, it's fine. And you can always remove it once the renal failure has improved. Don't forget to look at renal ultrasounds. If you're worried about signs of obstruction, renal ultrasound is going to find evidence of hydronephrosis or even a bladder scan to see if your bladder is full, if there's something obstructing the neck of the bladder that may be preventing you uh, or the patient from urinating. Renal ultrasound can also be helpful in distinguishing chronic kidney disease from acute kidney injury because on ultrasound you'll have signs of shriveled or degenerating kidneys which would be consistent with medical renal disease as opposed to normal looking uh, kidneys which may make you think more that this is indeed acute kidney injury. Finally, and probably the most important things you want to look at are your urine studies. You want to get a urinalysis, look at your urine st sediments and your specific gravity. A phena, which is very helpful, sometimes you'll get a urine sodium, potassium, or chloride levels on their own, and urine eosinophils, which are uh, is a very specific test for acute interstitial nephritis. So if this is a, a negative test, you can quite easily rule out acute interstitial nephritis. Once you have most of your data and information in front of you, you can begin trying to determine which category your acute kidney injury falls under, if it's pre-renal, post-renal, or if it's one of the intrinsic causes. Now, most commonly, people will uh, often use the serum BUN to creatinine ratio or the free extraction of sodium, also known as FENA, to help initially direct them because these tend to be two of the more easily available uh, uh, data points or information you can find. And for most patients where you have an elevated creatinine and an elevated serum BUN, which is greater than a ratio of 20 to 1, and you have a history consistent with dehydration or hypotension, that usually helps you diagnose your pre-renal azotemia um, or your uh, pre-renal acute kidney injury. Conversely, most of the intrinsic forms of acute kidney injury over here, their uh, ratio will be less than 20 to 1 uh, for most of them. So if you have ATN or acute interstitial nephritis, it will be greater than less than 21. 
But as you'll notice, this is not a great marker because obstructive causes of acute kidney injury can also have a ratio greater than 21, as can acute glomerular nephritis. So uh, if, you, if you have a good history and you're pretty confident, you can diagnose pre-renal, but no, this is not a perfect test. Uh, a much more sensitive and specific way of looking at uh, or trying to diagnose uh, uh, pre-renal kidney injury is getting the FENA. Because for most patients, uh, if your FENA is less than 1, which implies that you have very low uh, extraction of sodium, that really pretty much uh, can clinch your diagnosis of uh, pre-renal acute kidney injury. And your post and your obstructive forms or most of your intrinsic forms, this value is usually going to be greater than 1. Now, acute glomerular nephritis, it can be variable, but that's a pretty uncommon diagnosis. What you really need to be cautious of when you're looking at your FENA is there are certain conditions in which the FENA is not a reliable test. So if you have a history of being on diuretics that can, uh, that can impair uh, your sodium reabsorption, it can cause your FENA to be greater than 1 even if you may be pre-renal, or if you have a history of CKDs or any disease where it can already uh, have some underlying effect on your sodium excretion, obviously this can be a little bit inaccurate. Um, and just to let you know, for people who have ATN, usually this value is greater than 2. So your FENA tends to be what most people will go to when they're unsure if it's pre-renal or not, uh, just taking into consideration that there are a few caveats. If you can't use uh, your FENA to calculate it because someone's on diuretics, you can instead attempt to calculate uh, your FE, urea, your free extraction of urea, because that's not affected by diuretics the way sodium is and it can be a helpful substitute at times. Another very helpful thing to look at is your urine sediments and your specific gravity. Usually your urine sediments, you might find some hyaline casts with pre-renal disease, whereas if you start developing ATN, you might see some granular casts and some renal tubular cells. So if your urinalysis has some results that are more consistent with one picture compared to another etiology of acute kidney injury, you, you can sometimes use that to help uh, key you into what you think is your more likely diagnosis. Now, although we have these classifications in different groups, it's important to realize that sometimes you can have a continuum and that you can have more than one process going on. For example, a patient may begin uh, being dehydrated and having pre-renal failure, but if that pre-renal goes on long enough, they can eventually develop ischemia and ischemic ATN. So you can have a progression, you don't necessarily have to just think that one thing is going on. And it's another important reason why it's often very important to diagnose early on what's going on and treat it. If you think someone's pre-renal, you want to hydrate them quickly before they develop some worsening intrinsic kidney injury. We'll move on to perhaps the most important part of this before we wrap up this video on how you're going to be treating your acute kidney injury. And obviously this begins with what you what category type of acute kidney injury your patient has. Once you've determined your type, the first thing you want to do is, one, stop all nephrotoxic medications. You don't want to prescribe things like NSAIDs, like Toradol or ibuprofen. You want to hold or stop all ACE inhibitors and ARBs. You don't want to be giving contrast to these patients, etc. So you don't want to be giving them anything or continuing anything that can make their acute kidney injury worse. The second thing you want to do is you want to improve urine output. Regardless of what type of kidney injury you have, or whether it's oliguric, non-oliguric, or aneuric, you want to improve urine output. And the way you're going to do this is that you're going to be giving lots and lots of IV fluids. Okay? And the goal of your IV fluids is to improve your urine output. Now, a lot of people will wonder what kind of IV fluid should I use, how much should I dose it, etc. The simplest and best is just go with the normal saline and, and then base it off the patient's weight. If the patient's really dehydrated you can, and they have normal cardiac function, you can give them several liters of fluid boluses to start off with. But for maintenance IV fluids, you really just want to match what your urine output is. If someone starts urinating 100 or 200 mLs an hour, you want to be giving 100 and 200 mLs an hour. If you don't know, the very least you should go with is the patient's weight in kilograms plus 50. So the average person who might weigh 70 kilograms plus 50, you might want to give them 125 mLs an hour. But if your patient weighs 200 kilograms, you don't want to give them 125 an hour. You want to be giving them at least 250 an hour. And this is the minimum. For most patients, you're probably going to be, going to be even hydrating them most aggressively. And to really be sure that your IV fluid is at a correct rate, go back, look at your urine output, make sure you're at least matching that, if not increasing it.
The third thing you want to do is you want to treat your underlying disease. If you're having some kind of acute intrinsic process or an obstructive process that you've diagnosed with imaging, you want to remove the obstruction, you want to remove the offending agent. Once you've treated whatever the insulting agent is, a lot of times it's merely watching the patient and making sure they stay hydrated, again improving your output, until you can get them back to normal renal recovery. And of course if you have any doubts about what's going on or if you need assistance, you can always get a consultation and get some additional help. And I think this is especially true if the patient has a history of CKD, heart failure, or especially liver cirrhosis. It can be very challenging to manage renal failure in these patients because you may not know which way you're going. So if that's the case, don't hesitate to get help. Finally, make sure you watch electrolytes. If the patient's sodium starts going really down and they're getting hyponatremic, or if the potassium is going up, and you need to make sure you need to make sure that you're monitoring it so they become hyperkalemic. Make sure you're watching those and you're correcting them. And apparently, I can't spell electrolytes, but but hopefully that's that's okay. So you want to correct your electrolytes, and if need be, put them on a renal diet. Don't take any chances. Don't forget, simple interventions can often help. Okay, that's the end of this video. I hope you guys have found it helpful and useful, and I'll see you guys in lecture.